First of all, I uh, have previously talked to Charlene. She came to, she came to our house. And I told Charlene, as many people know me, I'm pretty well known all over. I spent the last 35 years in the penitentiary. And I'm not going to tell you how nice it is in there. What you're going to hear, I want you to get in your mind, it's not a playhouse. This is a place where guys are in there will cut your throat and not even think twice about it. Just imagine some, of this, some guy that weighs about 200 pounds is carrying a 14-inch knife on you and wakes up in the middle of the night and don't like you for what you look like and decides to cut your heart out. Well, I'm telling you, I lived with it and I seen it. I seen a man get his heart cut out, completely cut out of his chest and stuck in his mouth. This is what they do to people in prison. I spent 35 years in there. I spent two years on death row to be executed three different times. And I went behind drugs and alcohol and I watched guys take drugs in prison and get up on the fourth tier and want to play Superman and they died, splattered their brains all over the floor. And I watched many of them, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, do this, day in and day out. I have watched guys cut their wrists and cut their juggler veins because they couldn't handle life. And it's all behind drugs, hardcore drugs. This is not your nickel and dime that you find on the street. It's not street junk. This is stuff that pays $1,000, $3,000 for a day habit. And it's brought into prison by guards, smuggled in there. And what I'm telling you, and it's simply the way it is, I just got out, been out two months, a little over two months. Life inside a prison is not very nice. And what you hear is a lot of crap. What you hear on TV is a lot of crap. What you read in your books is a lot of crap. It's not real. You're looking at somebody who went there at the age of 15 years old. So I know what it's like. I was in there with people who three times they killed people, four or five times. I watched them walk down the, high, the hallways or the cells and take somebody and cut their throat and leave them laying and laugh at them while they're doing it. We were in child line. And a man walked up behind another man, took out a 14-inch blade knife and cut his head off and set it in the middle of the table. And we just kept on him. See, I've done those things too. I was part of that society because I didn't know how to live without booze and I didn't know how to live without drugs. And I got in there and I had to find a way to escape and I did. My first drink I had in there was Pruno, homemade whiskey. And I liked it. And I was on death row at the time. And I knew I was going to be executed anyway, so I really didn't care. I had no compassion for anybody and I had no feelings. And this is what I'm talking about, it's feelings. None at all. He brought me my first drink and I liked what he did. And my first pill, and I liked that too because it took me out of reality. I did not have to live in reality anymore. I finally came to a place in life where I fit again. This is where I would accept it, I thought, or so I thought I did anyway. And I like the feeling. I like the fact that guys were looking out after David. They did all these great things for me. And I learned how to live with them. I got off death row two years later through the state who gave me a state of execution. It gave me life in the day. It said I would never walk the streets again. And I said, that's good. I don't want to go out there anyway. I like it here. I have made friends in here. I know how to deal with drugs now, and I know how to drink. 17, 18 years old, and I thought I had all the answers. And I believed I did for a while. I really thought I had all the answers. And I liked it. I liked what was going on in prison. I got to know all these guys, the hardcore criminals. I'm talking about guys that were professional hitmen that worked for the mafia. In fact, I saw the guy for 10 years, his name was Jack Murphy, Murphy Sir. He took two women and blew a hole in their head. That's right. He blew a hole in their head, two of them, because they didn't like him. I saw this guy. And Jack would just pick up a phone and have you hit in a flat second. And he didn't bother him at all. That's how
how well protected the man was. He no, he's no longer in prison. That's the beautiful part of it. The man's a free man today. When I was in prison, I met a man in there that weighed about 200 pounds, 290 pounds, big man. I didn't like this man at all. I had no liking for him at all. And he said, one day at, the end, one day at a time, David, you know, never have to take another drink if you don't want to. And I told him he was crazy, absolutely nuts. And I wasn't going to sell with him. I wanted to drink some more. And I did. Up until 1961, I drank. I drank anything and everything I could drink. And I took any kind of a pill that they, they would give me to make me feel good. To 1961, October 31st, when I had my last drink and my last pill. And I didn't like the idea of quitting drinking. I didn't like the idea that I couldn't take pills anymore. And I knew if I continued to drink and take pills, I would die. Absolutely, physically, mentally, and emotionally and spiritually, I would die. Because I was sick and tired of wasting people in there. I have watched people and myself take a man and rip his guts open with a knife and watch him fall on the floor because the guy was not high on drugs. He had needle marks up and down his arm. It was unreal. Unreal the tracks that he had in his legs, in his neck. Any place he could put a needle, he would put it. Anywhere he could find a place to stick a needle, he would. And he lay in there one day and he just didn't like somebody for no reason. And he reached in his back where he always carried a knife and he ripped his man's belly open and his guts flew all over the tables and on the floor. And we all just sat there smoking and drinking coffee. He said, no big deal. What the hell? So another convict did. So what? And that's the way life is in there. You go in there with the attitude you think you're really, really tough. And you're going to run up against somebody that's going to make you prove it. About the time you get ready to hit this sucker, you're going to be dead. Absolutely dead. What should they do with people like that? They go in there with the attitude. Well, we'll just show these guys. I'll show them how tough I am. Yeah. I've heard it for 35 years, just how tough they really were. You know where they're at today? They're buried in Blue Hill, six feet under. The same attitude. But they thought they had the answers. Give them a few pills and a drink of whiskey and you want to play Tarzan. And some little sucker about 100 pounds walks up and cuts their throat. And they're dead. Bottom line, I've seen guys get picked up, thrown out the tears. Because there's sick people in prison. You think you got problems? You don't have any problems. None at all. Walk inside the penitentiary and watch a slam on you. Then your problems began. Who had no problems out here? Absolutely none. Continue playing with these pills and drinking, you'll all have them. I promise you, three things will happen, maybe four. You'll either die from alcohol or drugs or you walk down the street and somebody don't like you and you're going to cut your heart out or put a pistol in your mouth and blow your brains out or you're going to wind up in a mental institution. That happens too. I know. I'm a living example of what prison is like. A living example. I changed my life simply because I decided that drinking the pills was no longer the answer. That I would have to live some way without it. And I chose to do that. I came to believe in a power greater than myself who I call God today. And if there wasn't, I wouldn't be sitting here, believe me. I would not be having a full pardon today. Today I'm a free man. I go any place I want to go. And there's absolutely nothing anybody can do about it. I choose not to drink. Because I have choices. Drinking is not the answer. Popping pills smoking these funny left-hand cigarettes, not the answer either. And you know they got women prisons too, it's called Lowell State Penitentiary. And they're just as mean and just as nasty in the women's penitentiary as they are in the men's penitentiary. And these ladies in there, as I will call them, will take you and do the same thing. You would do it their way or else. And that's what we tell them. And I decided not to do it their way. 
first day off death row, I had to stab a man of what they do to you. And many people have heard this story, and they will tell you, if you've never seen the movie called Scare Straight, and I very strongly suggest you watch it, very strongly suggest that, because what they're saying in that movie is absolutely true. It's absolutely true. They pull no punches at all. And that's what they do to people in there, young ones. And they love the young kids that come in here, 17, 18 years old. They love them, they absolutely love them. Because I'm old life is gonna walk up and say, you're mine, sucker, whether you like it or not. Not very nice, is it? But that's how they treat you in there. It's not a nice place to go. It really is. I don't have to be there today. I don't ever have to go back there. And I have choices. My choice is that I stay out here in the street where I'm free. See, all you people got all these beautiful things in your lives. You got a home. You never lost anything. Well, try losing your freedom. Try losing your family. Have everything taken away from you. Because when you're in prison, you're not an American citizen anymore. You're not a citizen of the United States. You're absolutely nothing. You're a number. You're nothing but a convict. That's all you are. We treat you that way. You have no rights in prison. None at all. You go up there and tell that man, well, I have a right to a phone call and see what happens to you. Or I have a right to an attorney and see what they tell you. You have no rights at all. They're not called rights, they're called privileges, and you earn them. Tell them I want to write my mother or my father a letter and see what they tell you. You don't have a right, boy. You have no rights. Your rights run out the day you walked in here, and then you tattoo the number on you. And that's all you are. You become an animal, and they treat you as such. How they treat you in prison. And they cut your hair, they shave it off, so you will look like a convict. You think you think you have all the answers. Everybody does. Until the day comes they slap the handcuffs on you, send you send you off to the penitentiary. I wonder what happened, what did I do? Oh, we forget our gratitude to be grateful for what we have. What do you have? You have everything. Everything in the world you have. And if you continue using hardcore drugs or these cigarettes, marijuana, grass, you call it, or crack, see what happens to you. It's not very nice. It isn't very nice what happens. But that's what happens to people. You continue thinking, well, I'll smoke a little joint. It's okay for me to do that. Get by with trying to be hip slick and cool. And you're not really hip slick and cool. Because the guys who thought they were hip slick and cool are not on the streets today. They're in the joint. They play the system, as it's called. And one day the system turns against you. And what happens? <coughs> no, nothing there for you. No one there to help you anymore. You run out of answers finally. And they slap you out put you inside. You might get 15, 20 years, or you might get life, if you're lucky. Or you might just wind up dead, as they say. Not very nice, not a very nice picture. I didn't come in here planning on painting you a pretty picture. That's not my intention at all. Today I happen to be free, very free. I have nothing material-wise. I have nothing, absolutely nothing, but I have everything. Everything has been given to me. All my dreams, all my dreams I've ever had have come true. When I got out of prison and went to Seattle, I had nothing. No place to go, didn't know what I was going to do. Went to Seattle, nothing there. Went to Spokane, nothing. No money, nowhere to go. And I knew this, is if I didn't drink, take any pills, then 
and all the good things would happen to me as they told me. See, I made a verbal contract with God as I understand him. And if, I, if he wouldn't let me drink or take pills, then I would do what he wanted me to do. So I tried to go to Seattle and that didn't work. I went to Spokane. I went to Coeur d'Alene. I went all these places. And I finally came to Moses Lake. Not because I wanted to, because I never even heard of Moses Lake. <laughs> Moses Lake hell. Where in the hell is Moses Lake at? I didn't know what Moses Lake was. Like. What is and I thought, Moses. Well, yeah, I know this guy, Moses <laughs> of the Bible, you know. So, yeah, we'll go to Moses Lake. And it's been beautiful. It has absolutely been beautiful. I did three things. I kept my freedom, I kept my sobriety, and I kept my guys on the today. And I haven't found that to drink over anything. And my life is good today. It is absolutely fantastic. For the first time, I'm going back to school. At 50 years old, I'm going back to school. For me. See, it's not to impress you but to let you know where I'm at. See, I don't have no education either. In every place I went, people would kick my ass. No, we don't want you around. You got to go somewhere else. Oh, it's not that way today. Today I have many friends in Moses so Lake. I have a family. I have Jimmy here and two beautiful kids, absolutely beautiful kids. And it's all because it was given to me by God as I understand it. And I say this because it's true. I have watched many, many miracles happen, many of them. I have watched people's lives change, because I've been in this life, and they have changed. They have changed. Most of the time I'm on the go, 20, you know, all the time. I very rarely get to slow down. Last night I came down sick with a cold. I was sick this morning, and a great call I said, yes, I'll go over and walk. As bad as I feel, I decided I would make this effort. What I want to say, if you have any questions, just one at a time. Okay. Anybody have a question? Go ahead, Brian. I don't have a question, but um, I, I think that it's really neat that you're here talking to us. Not, thanks a lot. That's what How did they treat you in the penitentiary? Where? To uh, penitentiary. In the penitentiary, I went to death row. Oh, automatically. Straight there. I was sentenced to die. I went to the electric chair the third time, and on the outside of the electric chair was a phone, and the phone rang, and they gave me a, my final stay of execution. And the following few days later, I was given life in the day, which meant I would never walk the street. David, maybe, excuse me, um, a reality that a lot of these young people face is we have quite a few people that, um, for whatever reason, end up over in the juvenile detention center. And maybe we hear a lot of people saying, geez, it's great, we can lift weights and do the old pool ball games and everything else. Basically, what I'm interested in is, is once you get to your 18th birthday where you're treated as an adult, you can see how it changes, it differs. Um, so that's the message I want you guys to understand is the reality of, as, of the fun and games as a, a, as a young person growing up, perhaps, how serious the game becomes at your 18th birthday. And if the pattern continues on, which David certainly has expressed about alcohol and drugs and so forth, this is the living reality. And all I can say is I'm certainly happy this man sitting here today talking to you um, about this because we don't get this opportunity to hear this kind of a message. We hear, quote, professionals that go through school, but this certainly, unfortunately, um, this man should have a doctorate, you know what I mean, in, in, in these kind of realities. Um, you guys, any more questions? I'm sorry. I, I, I really appreciate you being here. This is just... Let me tell you, when you're, when you're in prison, there's no pool tables and there's no television in there, no weightlifting in there. There might be a little white pile, but there's no ball games in there, no basketballs, nothing. Nothing at all. You might get to read a, little, a, a book in them now and then, if you're lucky, in a little library, smaller than this room, much smaller than this room, if you're lucky. 
and you're locked down 99% of the time, you're not free. And if you go in there with that attitude, well, I go on white pile, I can play basketball, football, baseball, softball, watch color TV, get it out of your head. That is not true. You don't eat steaks in their pork chops. You don't get all this fine food that you get out here. Absolutely none. There's guys in there that don't have Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's, none of these holidays. You don't get things like that in there. And what I hear mostly from the young people out here on the streets, I don't have enough. I want more. I want new clothes. I want a new car. I want a new motorbike. Instead of being grateful for what we have instead of what we don't have. It's called gratitude. And gratitude comes from feelings. The down, deep, gut level hurting feelings. How do I express my feelings? You simply talk to someone. And if you can't talk to your parents, I'll leave my phone number here. You can call me any day, time or night. And I'll be happy to talk to you. In fact, you can come over to my house. But we talk about feelings and that's where they're at. I can't talk to my mother because she doesn't understand. I can't talk to my father because he doesn't understand. And you find someone you can talk to. And you talk about your feelings. How it hurts down inside. And that's what we have to deal with. Why do we drink? Because I feel bad. I feel less than. Until you learn how to deal with your feelings, you're going to feel these things. Until you learn to get it out of your system, you're going to run, and what you run to is the booze and drugs. You find you run right into the slammer. When you're 18 years old, you will have choices, I can guarantee it. You will reach your final destination and say, boy, I'm 18 now, I go out party time. You sure can. And I wish you the best when you do it. And I guarantee you. You're going to face reality when you're out there. And you're going to think, okay, I can do it now. Nobody can tell me anything. Unfortunately, there's a lot of them that are buried. They're dead. I hate to see that happen today. I really do. I don't like seeing young kids go to prison. It's a sad, sad feeling. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. We waste it because of our feelings. I don't feel good. So I'll drink. And I'll take a pill. I've worked hard all day. So I need a drink. Sure you do. It's the only way you can escape. Find other things to do. Find hobbies. Do something. Go for a ride. Go the park, fish, hunt, read a book, but drink is to die, and in time you will. Your liver will swell up on you, and when it swells up on you, it's over with. It is over with. You will die from cirrhosis of the liver, or you will become a wet brain and a mental institution. That's your alternative. Try to be hip, hip, and cool out here, walking around with these kids that think they have all the answers. Get behind the school grounds or in their car and party, smoking this grass, popping a few pills, blowing snow up your nose, taking a drink, and you get down the street and suddenly you hit somebody. Just like that. And they're dead. They're dead forever. You are dead. You're dead me. See, you have an alternative today. You have a choice. It's your choice. It's not mine. It's not my choice today. It's yours. It's your choice today. To drink or not to drink. To take a pill or not to take a pill. To get an education. You're young. All of them are just kids. And I hate to 
see your lives wasted by running away. You know, because you have so much going for you. I see you and I see myself. Well, I could have been if I'd listened, but I didn't. So I wound up killing a man. Not very nice. All I know this for sure is, excuse me, don't drink, don't take any pills. If you need to call somebody, call our house. You need to get a hold of Gene and get a hold of me. My phone is open if you want to talk. I don't care if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock, it doesn't matter. You can call me. Greg has my phone number, Charmaine has my phone number, and you're welcome to use it. Excuse me. Um, I'm done. Okay, thank you. One thing um, that face a lot of these these young people is the communication problems they have with parents. Um, I can sense that from the things that you just said. What possibly can you give these young people now, if um, as far as communicating with parents and talking and, and sharing feelings, is is there a way that you could yeah. help these people? If you're feeling uptight, now I don't know what kind of homes you come from, but if you're really feeling uptight, take your mother to the side or your dad. Take them to the side and say, look, I really need to talk. You know, whatever it is. If you hide anything from them, they're going to sense it, first of all. They're going to sense there's something wrong. But if you're, you've got to be willing to sit down and say, this is what I'm really feeling. Try to understand when I'm feeling. Get a commu communication line up and them. No matter what it is, no matter how bad you think it sounds, talk about it. Have communication, eye to eye contact. Do not look at your parents like this. That's not communication. It's eye to eye contact. Try to keep an open, honest communication with your parents at all times. You, know, you say, no, I can't do that. They don't understand. That's the excuse. They don't understand me. Try it one time. Sit down and talk to them. And if that fails, there's other routes you can go. You have a friend? Call your friend. Say, I'd like to talk to you about whatever, but get a communication. Have consciously communication with someone in your family. Hopefully you will be able to do this. But they will come to understand what you're dealing with, your feelings. And that's what they are, they're feelings. Feelings are not right or wrong, they're just feelings. There's no wrong or right in feelings, they're feelings. And if you're hurting bad enough, you will talk to someone. Call somebody, but have a communication open where you can talk to them. And if all else fails, call me. I'll set up with you all night. I've done it. I set up four or five hours, eight hours. It doesn't matter. Try with your family first, with your mother or your father, get an open communication going. Because it is important that they understand where you're coming from. They need to know this too. They need to feel what you're feeling. They need to feel this so they'll come to understand and help you. And they will help you, but you've got to be honest with them. And if you're lying to them, no, forget it. No, forget it. You, know, you can't run a game on your parents forever. you got to be honest with them. Call a counselor. If you can't call me, and I'll get you in contact with a counselor. I, w I will, because I know a few of them. I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Now, I'd be willing to do this. I'm willing to do this today because I don't want to see your lives messed up either. I really don't. Because you're all so young. And there's a better way of life for you. There really is. You know, communication is the most important thing in your life today. Having an open communication. That's where it's at. Any other questions? 
Gee, oh. this is the most the soberest I've ever seen you guys. Usually you have incredible questions. I, I'm, I'm certainly happy this is sinking in. Uh, David, um, maybe it would be interesting for them to know <clears throat> how you came from where you were to where you are today. What happened in between? Well, what's happened in between was during my prison time, I didn't understand a lot of things. I was young, I was stupid, and I was ignorant. When I met this man, he worked with me every day. And he told me, David, if you don't ever want to take another drink today, you don't have to one day at a time. And I continued to listen to this man, and he got me involved in Alcoholic Anonymous. Okay? I kept reading the big book. It's what it's called, the big book of Alcoholic Anonymous. And I did this for about 18 years. I read it every day. I read a page out of it. And then I decided one day to pick up the Bible and start reading the Bible too. But the Bible is another, like the big book. It taught me how to find the answers for David. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. I had to deal with a lot of feelings. And I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to deal with that little boy on the side of me that was hurting, that was crying. I was, it was really, really screwed up. I didn't want this. But I had been knocked around since I was a kid. I mean, I had been physically thrown up against the walls. So I learned not to laugh and I learned not to cry. On my 18th birthday of sobriety, I went to a meeting and for the first time in my life, I cried. The very first time. I didn't know how. I didn't want to really feel these feelings, these emotions that I had. I didn't want to feel these things. I didn't want people to see me cry. I didn't want people to see me laugh either. If I laughed, they thought maybe something wrong with me. The guy's laughing. So every day I had to deal with different feelings, the pain of my childhood. I didn't want to deal with that. I come from a defunctional family. They were both alcoholics, they were both dead today. And I wished many times as a child my father would die. And one day he did. And I had to live with that guilt. And I wished my mother would die. And she did. And that's a lot of guilt. I blame myself. If only I hadn't done this, or if only I hadn't done that, they both still be alive. But that's not true. It's not true today. Today I've come to love both my parents. Because I know today they're in a better place. I came to believe in God in prison. I'm not religious, 